what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, constitutes four years of research into the lives of our boys and girls today. What I like to do as a social researcher is get under the skin of, to actually understand from the person's point of view how life is for them. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is how our boys and girls in the 21st century are seeing their lives from the inside. But what I also love to do as a researcher is to really examine the landscape that our children are living in. What creates the anxieties, the aspirations? Why is it that a 15-year-old girl feels that her life's going to end if she can't have the branded handbag or the guy with his, his, his branded board shorts? And why is the anxiety around peers so incredibly intense? So we're going to try and collapse four years of research into um, 40 minutes. So we'll do our best. I will probably be talking quite quickly because I want to give you as much as possible. Some of the things I'm going to talk to you about will be a bit disturbing, and that's not because I've come here to um, frighten anybody, but just to actually help you understand why so many of our kids feel like we are living on another planet. Um, because we are facing an ever-widening generation gap. I've used the word toxic shock because I feel that the environment our kids are inhabiting at the moment is, is seriously toxic in the sense that it is a culture that encourages and promotes risk purely to make money out of our kids. Now, that's a huge statement. So let's have a look at some of the detail. When I got going talking to the many, many boys and girls I did, one of the things that really started to hit me is that our kids are living in what I call a performance culture. What do I mean by that? I mean that our kids feel that they have to be amazing 24-7, that their packaging has to be amazing, what they're doing has to be amazing, because they feel they're under the spotlight all the time. So there's no time for the, the real person, the individuality, what makes a person special to grow and, and, and kind of find its voice, because you're in this constant state of anxiety all the time which is very much fed by the, the whole uh, marketing climate that kids uh, have, uh, are subject to. More than this, we are now living in an environment of economic imperative. Now, I do want to say I'm not against entrepreneurialism, people doing wonderful things. We need that. Our, our society needs that. Our world needs that. But it's very interesting, the language we now use um, for so many things. We, we talk about, instead of talking about people, we talk about social capital. Our homes are no longer just sanctuaries where we can go and kind of chill out from the, um, the, the messiness of, of life. They have become assets which we have to, uh, to be aware of all the time and uh, always have an eye on the price in case we might flog uh, our home at any one time. What we're now seeing, and what I'm going to show you very, very briefly, is that advertisers have our kids in their sights from birth, because babies from six months up are worth billions to different corporations. So that whole thing of seeing our children through the lens of an economic imperative is alive and well today. Another interesting thing that's happened is that because our homes are our assets, that uh, we've taken to, uh, we, because the world out there also is pretty frightening, whether it's uh, global financial crises, political crises, whatever. And so what we, has happened, one of the social trends is that we've become very keyed into lifestyle. Um, we can't do anything about what's happening in Iraq at the moment, but we can renovate our bathroom and kitchen, or we might even choose to renovate ourselves with a bit of Botox and what have you. And what's happened is our homes, we've cleared them of so many things that actually hold our stories because it doesn't kind of fit the decor anymore. Um, you know, Auntie Thing's old clock and, and different, different things that actually held our children's story. And I'm going to come back to this loss of story because what we see now, or what certainly I saw with, with all the research I did, is that kids know very little about their own story. They don't know who they are and where they come from. In, in a kind of profound sense, but they can tell you what Beyonce and everybody else is doing at any one moment. 
Okay, and so what I also see happening around this is that not only are our kids under a lot of pressure, but parents are too. And I spend my time going around uh, here and, and in Australia talking to uh, many groups, but a lot of parents. And I must have talked to about 50,000 parents over the last three or four years. And everywhere I go, um, I see parents stressed out and worried and concerned about making good calls. And I see parents under the same pressure as our children. They too are under the thrall of the call factor. They know that perhaps they shouldn't allow their 14-year-old daughter to go to that party because it's probably not a great scene going on there. But instead of listening to their gut, they're worried about whether or not they're going to be seen as uncool parents. And my message to them is it's time to make uncool parenting super cool. Another thing that I think has kind of tended to wear us all down a bit is the news cycle, the 24-7 news cycle, which really is 24-7 bad news. And this adds to the stress that we feel as, as adults. Often it can be very disempowering but also for our kids. I can tell you that a lot of them feel that they are about to inherit a world that is really falling drastically to pieces. Now, sure, there's some big issues, but you know, our parents and grandparents had the depression and two world wars. I don't think that was probably much fun either. It's life, and they need to understand this. So very quickly, let's have a look about baby boys. One of the things that I noticed uh, when I was doing the research for, for uh, around boys is that still we feel uncomfortable about allowing boys and emotional uh, language that we, we want them to be strong and independent and we're, we're afraid that if we allow emotions and the uh, talking of emotions that somehow they'll end up as wussy. Um, but what we are doing actually is, uh, is disempowering our boys when this happens because they are growing up in a very, very complex world where they need to be able to understand where they're at emotionally and to be able to read other people's emotions. There's a wonderful uh, piece of research around that, but I must keep going. Um, but let me give you an example um, about... Uh, boys and girls as far as emotions are concerned. There was a wonderful piece of research done in the States at Duke University, and they took a baby and they wrapped it up first in pink and they had adults interact with it. And of course, everybody was holding the baby close and cooing and you know, being generally protective. And then they wrapped the same baby boy in blue and everybody was holding it at a distance. And for some reason, we like to poke baby boys. I don't know why. Um, and and we began to see how that changes, uh, how, how already from birth we are treating our girls and boys differently. And one of the things I want to get across today is that I know our girls are very vulnerable in this climate uh, that we now have for kids, but boys are even more so because there are a lot of issues like not allowing boys a strong emotional life as they grow. Um, these things were not dealt with before the 21st century hit. So I actually feel that our boys have a double whammy to deal with, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, I mentioned to you that uh, advertisers have boys and girls in their sights from being very, very little. For years, the advertisers knew that babies retained a branded logos from six months, but they didn't know how to product place until 1999, and a professor came along called James McNeil, very bright marketing global uh, guru, and he realized that if you, when babies first start to sit up, they tend to sit forward like little hunched bears and dribble a lot and stare down at their dribble. He realized that all those fun figures we're very, very familiar with, Bob the Builder, Thomas the Tank, we all know them, that if you place those logos, well, there are logos, by the way, because behind those fun figures sits multi-billion dollar corporations, the Wiggles, multi-billion, etc. If you place those fun figures on a baby's T-shirt, on their bib, and if you're wondering why they're on the crotch of disposable nappies like Huggies, now you know. Product placement begins pure and simple. If you get that in the home at six months, by the time a child is two, even though it mightn't have the language for it, it will be able to recognize uh, Dorothy the dinosaur or whatever. And what happens with that dynamic? You're in a shopping center somewhere, your little one sees that cute fun figure, 
their little face lights up with recognition. We get the dopamine fix, and we can't wait to get our hands in our pockets to buy the jocks and socks, etc. Most devastatingly, although most of us don't know this, so I don't want you to feel guilty, we buy the DVD, which actually pay good money for it, is just an animated ad. We take it home and we put the little one or little ones in front of this DVD. We don't just play it once or twice; we play it over and over and over again. I can tell you, for a corporation, it doesn't get much better than that. And then we have, then we say, I don't know why, but you know, Sean is mad on Bob the Builder. Well, I can tell you why. When I found this out, I, I, I must say, I felt quite sickened to think that we would really have such little children in our sight. So. Um, and I, this was studying Unitex, by the way. This wasn't just reading some vague uh, piece of work somewhere. So I decided to go out and talk to preschool and kindy professionals and just ask some nice, open-ended questions, which were: Are we seeing any difference in the kids who are coming to kindy and preschool now as compared to kids 10 years ago? And they said to me, "Absolutely, Maggie." They knew nothing about what I was looking for. They said we are seeing unprecedented levels of anxiety, and I asked about what. And they said, "Do I have the right brand of backpack to go to、um, preschool? The right brand of lunchbox?、Um, do I have the right body? Do I have the right hair?" The other thing they said is that they're seeing a radical drop in these children's imaginations. That in the playground they are playing the scripts of the DVDs they've seen over and over. Now, imagination isn't just about whether we're going to be an artist. Imagination is actually about understanding choice, different ways of doing things, being able to problem solve. When we shut this down in our kids, it makes them even more suggestible. <clears throat> So what we're now seeing, because girls have been、um, targeted in this way for a number of years, but it's only in the last three or four years that this has actually happened to little boys. Nickelodeon, Disney, all these、uh, corporations have been spending millions on targeting boys, and so actually probably five years now. What we're now seeing is that boys are going down that same route girls are in terms of anxiety. So what I found from my research was that basically the seeds of self-loathing and anxiety are now starting in this generation at three, four, and five before they've gone to school or learned to read or write. So by the time they hit teenage years, which is normally when we wake up and realise there's a few problems, these patterns are hugely ingrained. They have had a decade of practising hating themselves. And not feeling good about themselves and, and being very suggestible. So, we're going to have a look at tweens for one minute. If you're interested in the whole tween area, the six to twelves,、um, then <clears throat> you should look at Martin Lindstrom's work. He's written a book called Brand Child, which has everything in. So, you've got this situation. By the time our little boys and girls are going to school, already they're anxious about looks, hair, etc. From six to twelve is when they really get what is needed <clears throat> under their belts. They get to learn the cool fact inside and out. Most of their spare time is spent in、um, packaged entertainment, DVDs, etc.,、um, watching movies or shopping. Not a lot of life experience going on there.、Um, and and、uh, we're now starting to see in this age group friendships being formed around brand loyalty. What we're also starting to see is the sexualisation of this age group. This is taken from、uh, French Vogue not lot long ago. This is a little girl,、uh, Tilan, who is ten, and we are seeing now the sexualisation of girls slipping into eight, nine, and ten. And you cruise in it, you won't have to look very, very far. This is also very much in tune with where porn is heading. Uh, the two areas, which I'll talk a bit about later, and one is very much、um, sex with kids, and the other is the torture of women. But we'll talk about that a little later. So I mentioned before that、um, one of the things that interests me is getting under the skin of. Now I think you're probably all aware of what sexting is: sending inappropriate sexual messages and texts、um, on your phone to somebody. This is something that we associate with teenage life. But what we're now seeing, <clears throat> because of the sexualisation of younger and younger children, is this is happening from age eight up. 
At age eight, it's probably just, you know, taking a photo of your boob, bare boobs. And by the time you get to teenage life, um, you know, we're seeing sexting, which would make any X-rated movie proud. The reason kids do this is because they're living in this performance culture, they're not feeling good about themselves. If they're feeling they're slipping in their peer group, then to do something risky like sexting makes a lot of sense. So from their point of view, it is actually very, very beneficial. What we're now seeing also is a lot of games, uh, there's a lot of free games for young kids on the net um, from six-year-olds up, and we're seeing a lot of sexualized games as well creeping in. Um, just for an example, because I'm already behind time, um, the, bottom, the one on the bottom uh, here on, on my right, on your right, is called Naughty Classroom, and the whole point of the game is to look down the teacher's top um, look up her skirt at her, her panties, and if you can do that without being caught, uh, then you get extra points. Uh, the one above that is about stripping a girl. What, what we see with the corporations is that they're taking our children's aspirations and anxieties and turning them into products. And so we've got, we start off with Ben 10, which is actually quite violent. I don't have time to go into the details why, but I can tell you that preschool professionals have seen a huge change in behaviour since that game came out. But soon they're graduating onto games like Grand Theft Auto, which um, I think grossed 510 million in its first week when it came out, the new version came out last year. This is, this is uh, where a lot of boys spend their time, and the whole point of Grand Theft Auto is to uh, progress through organised crime through doing various things. One of the things you can do is kill a prostitute. And so in the game, you cruise through town to the red blight area and you cruise up and down the streets looking at the girl, choosing the girl you're going to kill. You get her in the car and you take her to a deserted spot because the whole point is not to be found. Because she has a prostitute, you have sex with her, you pay her, you have the sex, you see all this on screen. This is a game boys seven up are playing and it's a very mild one. Then you get your money back because you're going to kill her you drag her out of the car, and there's a number of ways you can kill her, but one of them is bludgeoning her to death with a baseball bat. You see it, you see the blood spatter, you hear the sounds and the cries. Then when this poor girl's dead, you go to the boot of your car and you get out some gas and you torch her and set her alight because you don't want the evidence. These are the games that our kids are playing. The, the, one of the themes we're seeing is sex and violence intertwined. There's a wonderful neuroscientist called Susan Greenfeld, one of my great her heroines, and what she says about this environment is that we are creating a situation which is infantilizing the brain. And she talks about a whole lot of things, but because our kids are not getting real-life experiences, understanding who they are and where they've come from, and starting to actually grow up with having to do difficult things, make difficult choices, take responsibility for their actions, etc., etc. She said what we're doing is keeping them at an infantile stage. And she said infantile stage is where we, uh, it's all about us, we have to have things and we have to have it now, and we have to be told we're wonderful all the time. This is something we normally grow out in our tween years, but what we're seeing now is that we are not growing out of it in our teen years, and actually this new generation, Gen Y, is not growing out of it in their 20s. This is why we are now talking psychologically as 30 being the new 20, because of this huge immaturity, which makes them very vulnerable. Because of the huge advertising now of two boys, of fashion items, we are also seeing eating issues for boys going down the same track girls are. For boys, it goes two ways. It can either be that heroin chic, anorexic, androgynous look, or that need to be pumped up. And apart from the porn sites, the darkest sites I've seen on the net are the ones around eating issues, where we have galleries of you know, the kind of uh, things that our boys and, of course, our girls are aiming for. Um, which tell you how to fool mum and dad you're eating, how to live on 300 calories a day, if you bulimic, what to do so that your teeth don't fall out because you've, you, know, you keep throwing up so much, the acid ruins your teeth. Dark stuff. Just talking about binge drinking for a minute, 
somebody mentioned drinking alcohol before. It's very easy for people of our age to say nothing much has changed, you know, teenagers have always drunk, etc. But we're seeing some very stark and concerning evidence about, around drinking patterns. Because of the huge marketing of breezes or Alcopops to kids, um, we are now seeing uh, an introduction to spirits much, much earlier on. And uh, particularly with girls who particularly don't like uh, the spirits. And of course that is much, uh, much harder on the body. In emergency wards, they are seeing girls as young as 12 coming in so drunk they can't breathe. Often these girls have brain injuries, broken bones, um, and frequently they have had sex. The really sad and kind of depressing thing is that these girls, they, uh, they don't remember anything about it, so there's no knowledge of whether this was actually a consensual act or not unless the girl has been battered, because often her friends don't know either. Where the boys are concerned, every single teenage boy I spoke to felt that drinking made the man. And we are talking of drinking excessive, excessive amounts. Right around the Western world, we are seeing more and more of our young people being admitted to emergency wards with alcoholic, alcohol poisoning of livers, that are failing with the amount of alcohol they are drinking. And just to keep the sales up, the alcohol manufacturers who absolutely are targeting our teens um, are aware that teenagers sooner or later either kind of pass out or fall asleep with, with um, drinking. So now we have energy drinks with alcohol in so that we now have a new phenomenon, the wide awake drunk, which is one of the reasons why we are seeing in certain areas of our cities these um, really concerning behaviours with king hits and all that kind of terrible fighting because we now have the wide awake drunks who don't have to go to sleep. I could go on and on about it, but it's serious stuff. So that's our um, energy drinks that keep our kids awake. I want to talk to you about porn for a minute and then we'll talk about some of the solutions. I could talk forever, but I mustn't. Um, I mentioned to you that porn is going in two directions, um, very much uh, promoting uh, scenarios of sex with children, um, incest scenarios, um, sex with the babysitter, I could go on and on. And the Americans have been very clever about this because they have led the kind of new frontier in porn and that is that they are using animated figures in these scenarios, which are so realistic, you would not know that this is a real child, wasn't sex with a real child. And of course, in the third world, we are praying, the first world is praying constantly on their children, impoverished children. One of my friends was in a, at a porn conference in London a little while ago, and she met this woman from Washington. And her, she had a special unit, and her job was to match the photos of missing boys and girls to pornography that they had seized. I mean, this is how dark and, and distressing this whole thing is. So what we're now seeing is, um, is the pornification of, of society to a whole other level through various um, you know, visuals and um, music clips, Everywhere we look, we have these images. And, and, you know, some say, oh, it's only the rogue advertisers that uh, do this kind of thing. Well, apart from an ad for jeans, the only thing I can see there is an ad for group sex. And this is Calvin Klein. So it's not the rogue advertisers. It's everywhere. And I think the sad thing is, sex is a beautiful thing. And what we are doing is, is creating something that is dark and impersonal and brutal and brutalizing, not only of someone's body, but of their spirit. And I think this is what, what is a very dangerous thing going forward. Somebody mentioned domestic violence. Um, one of the psychologists who I talk to quite a lot, and he does a lot of work in the men's movement and with men and um, around domestic violence. And he said to me, Maggie, he said, if we are concerned about domestic violence now, with this kind of lack of empathy and stuff, he said, it's going to be much, much worse in the future. And I think it's very easy to concentrate just on our girls in terms of this pornified 
uh, climate. But I think we have to realise that for our boys it's very, very hard. Where do the boundaries lie in being able to treat another person with beauty and dignity and joy and fun and spontaneity? So we're now seeing the kind of attitude from the porn industry coming into uh, pop culture, and I could give you dozens of examples, but this is one of the T-shirts that's been going around. It's not rape if you yell surprise, as if rape's some kind of funny thing that you can have. I found this quote on porn, which I think is wonderful, which basically says what I was saying, that the porn industry, in its dark, dark form that we are seeing it now, really crushes everything that is beautiful about the human spirit and disconnects those who get uh, addicted to it because believe me, it's, it's very addictive and I have some very sad addiction stories I could tell. And you end up living on the fringes. Because what I found with the boys, with my previous piece of research and men, is that behind that, that tough exterior is an immense amount of tenderness and vulnerability. And we see all this pornification, of course, in, in toiletries, etc. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we need to get up to speed with what's happening out there so that we can have good conversations with our kids. We've got to get them beyond this feeling that they are only as valuable as the clothes they're wearing or their hair. That cool costs big time. Every time they hear the word cool, we actually need a ka-ching. We need a, an audio prompt for them to realize this. We need a much more sophisticated media education in schools so that our kids can pick when they're being marketed to and then make choices. This is not about them not being able to be fun, funky 21st century kids wearing funky gear, but this is actually about giving them the choice back when and where they do this. I think also we need to go back to basics. We've become very scared of touch as a society because of our concerns around pedophilia. And I do feel this lack of touch that our children has does make them vulnerable in the sexual climate and that they actually need not only lots of touch and hugs and uh, physical love, but the messiness of being part of their environment what I see now with so many of our kids and the research I've done is that nobody um, is meant to get dirty or, you know, because they're all wearing their little designer outfits. They're children, for heaven's sake. Let's give them back their childhood. Let's let them have adventures in sand and mud and climbing trees and scraping knees. And yes, occasionally someone might break a bone, but let's make them part of the world they're going to inherit. We need to get back to sitting around the kitchen table and eating. Kids can't hold on to stuff. They need to be able to talk about it. And the kitchen table is a great way to do that. Eating together and making food fun again. We've all become so neurotic about food. Why are we surprised our kids have eating issues? The joy of eating a meal with those we love is not just about filling our tummies, it feeds our spirits, and our kids need that. These kids need one-on-one -on -one time. You need to create strong conversation culture in the home where you're afraid to tackle all subjects, including the embarrassing ones. If you don't want to talk about sexual issues and, and these kinds of things, whatever is age appropriate, then your kids are a mouse click away from finding that information, but it might not be in a way and a form you want. So create that, that openness so that you are the first person to come to, not the last. And this generation doesn't like to be eyeballed. We have to have more stealth and more subtlety than that. So out walking the dog, when you're driving to school, in those moments, that's the time to start meaningful and powerful conversations. These kids need friendships across the generations. They need to know the stories of who they are, but more importantly than that, they need to understand there are different ways of being. They need to understand the ages of life and to have, have walked with it and, and got the taste and smell of what that's about. We've got to get them off computers and into real life. Sure, computers are great, but they're not the answer to everything. I also think we need to help them deal with the big moments of life so that when their grandma dies or something happens at school and a friend needs their help, that they actually know what is needed 
to help with that. And we, they can only do that if we help them with that. I always like to say every child needs a signature dish. You know, often when there's a big gathering at home, kids are on the periphery and they feel, you know, they, they kind of feel on the fringe. So they need to have significant skills to add to that barbecue. You know, if Sean is fantastic at putting up some fairy lights in the tree in the garden or helping make a pavlova, they need to be actively involved in those events. I mentioned before about stories. I've just grabbed a whole lot of magazine covers. I mean, you don't have to look very far. And I believe very powerfully, I guess because I'm a wordsmith and words are very powerful and, and, and important to me, I do believe the stories we tell as a society are the stories we become. And what we see here are stories of sad, dysfunctional lives of people who actually have contributed almost nothing to the planet. What I see is the difference between that and when I was a kid was that we were told the stories of the Greeks and the Romans and Bible class stories, etc. Those were stories about transcendence. They were about hope. They told us that life wasn't easy, but there were always people there who could help and that guides often came in the most unusual guise, not the obvious people who were there to help you and that one had to keep going to finish the quest. This is not what our kids are getting with this rubbish. So they need to know these stories, stories contained in letters and postcards in family. Passion. Often parents say to me, I don't know what to do with, you know, whoever. Look at what they're passionate about and help them ignite that because that is part of what they've come here to do. I like William. He, he's a ghetto boy, a musician. Some of you might know him, you might not. He's a bit full on, he's full of energy. I'm sure he's ADHD many times over. But somebody asked him one day, hey man, are you on drugs? And he said, no, I'm taking music. Music was what he lived for. Our children need curiosity. We've got to get them out of that whatever culture into being curious and excited about life. Life is a privilege, it's precious, it's short. A culture of usefulness, service. If I might tell you one very quick story of some boys in Adelaide at a very posh Catholic boys' school. One of the teachers there, she said, Maggie, I was so tired of seeing these boys. They had everything money could buy, but she said they didn't have what was needed to carry them into adult life. So she took them off to India to one of Mother Teresa's places. And there, they did a whole lot of things in India, but at Mother Teresa's they worked with severely handicapped kids. And she said, you know, the, these beautiful 17, 18 year old boys, the first day they went into the room, they couldn't bear to stay there seeing these kids so, so um, handicapped, but by the, disabled. But by the end of that time, do you know they were holding those children in their arms, feeding them out of their hands? And she said, every year we'd get back to the plane, Maggie, and she said, these beautiful big boys would cry. They didn't want to come home. They didn't want to go back to that place where it was all about the car they drove and their address because they had touched something real, something that grew their humanity. And she said, you know, the amazing thing was these kids would come back and they didn't want Christmas presents because they had enough. They knew, not because we were banging on about it, because they knew in here. And she said they'd go off to uni and they would just skyrocket. Isn't that what we need to give our children? belonging, usefulness, to grow their beautiful humanity. What I see with our boys is that they are struggling to know how to become a man. And they need every man in this room to model the beauty and the power of what a real man is, not what the crazy male celebrities are doing out there. If any of you are involved with educational institutions, I cannot recommend this uh, course called The Right Journey, which is for boys and girls, which takes them through a year's rite of passage um, where they grow physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And you meet those kids, it's done as they just get into high school, they are transformed. I can, it, it's a brilliant scheme. In closing, I think what we have to look at, and this is a big one, but it's happened environmentally and I feel now it has to happen socially, that our 
um, corporations, and I'm not, ba I'm not bashing them completely by any means, because there is positive entrepreneurialism out there that makes our world a better place. But I feel that we not only have to have uh, the economic uh, success or otherwise of, of companies reported, which obviously they do, and we have the environmental one, I think we need to add to that bottom line the social impact of what those products are having on our community, particularly our beautiful, beautiful children. I want to thank you for today and just wanted to say we must not feel disempowered in this climate because it is up to us to create the future for these children. We want them to stand on our shoulders, to be excited to be adults, to be excited about what they can do when it's their turn to lead and take the planet forward. Thank you for your time.